Okay, friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hey, Lane. Welcome back, everybody. And Lane, of course, has another beautiful amaryllis. If you are listening to this on a podcast, I'm telling you, hop on over to YouTube so you can watch. Not only is the slideshow always helpful, but she oftentimes has one of her beautiful bulbs in (laughs) bloom, and the bloom is as big as her head. It's really beautiful, Lane. Really, really beautiful. (laughs) All right, friends. So this podcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, where both Lane and I kind of hang out. And Lane is the seed manager at the Gardeners Workshop. And I'm not sure what I am, but I hang out there quite a bit. And if you want to learn more about the work we're doing or visit our online garden shop or check out some of our online courses, head over to thegardenersworkshop.com. So Lane, what's the topic today? So today we are going to be talking about a highly requested topic and it's going to be fertilizer routines. Mm. So how do you fertilize seedlings in your grow room? How do you prepare your beds with fertilizer? And then how do you fertilize the plants that are out in your garden or field growing? So we are going to talk about the steps, exactly what Lisa does on the farm and Hopefully that'll give you all a good jumping off place for fertilizing in your own situation, garden or field. Awesome. And before we get started, I just want to say that it's always a good idea to do a soil test before you start amending your soil with fertilizers or anything else. Wouldn't you agree, Lisa? That is so very true, Lane. I tell people if you are gardening or farming without soil tests, you're like farming and gardening with a blindfold on. The only Thing that we add to our soil um, without a soil test telling us to, to add it is just general purpose organic fertilizer, which feeds your soil actually and not your, your actual plant. So yes, totally agree. Fall soil tests in the fall is just a great routine to make it part of your fall prep. Yes. And that kind of leads into our first question, which is why do you use organic fertilizers rather than synthetic? You know, what a great question. And, you know, uh, for many, many years, I never really truly understood the difference between the two. I just kind of thought organic just means it's the right thing to do, right? Because you hear people talking about being sustainable and all those types of things. But in fact, organic fertilizers feed your soil and everything that lives in it typically. And so each application makes your soil healthier each time. And so after year, after year, after year of using organic type products, your soil is just so much healthier. And that is not the case with synthetics. Synthetics simply feed your plants, but then it leaches away through your soil. And to get any added benefit, you have to apply them again. And I just never really understood that. And, you know, we know that there is damage that is done to the organisms that live in your soil with repetitive synthetic product use because there's products in there that actually, I mean, I I can remember telling people when we used to do so many conferences and talks and programs, and I would ask, is anybody here ever poured salt on a slug with your kids or your grandkids, you know, to see what happens, how it just shrivels them up and kills them? Well, that's exactly what the salts and synthetic fertilizers does to the microorganisms that live in your soil. It hurts, damages, or kills them. And then there's nothing in your soil. So it kind of makes the light bulb went on for me. So that's why I use organics rather than synthetics. Yes. And when you're talking about applying organic matter or incorporating organic fertilizers into your beds, like Lisa said, you're actually feeding the soil. So the microorganisms in the soil are going to take that organic material and digest it, break it down and make the nutrients available to the plants. So you're encouraging and supporting all that soil life. Your soil structure should improve over time. And there are a lot of other benefits as well. With synthetics, the nutrients are all available to the plants right away versus the more gradual release when you apply an organic fertilizer to a bed and the microorganisms have to actually convert a lot of that organic material into nutrients that the plants can actually use. So you really are feeding the soil versus just giving a quick fix to a plant. 
Yes. It's like a quick fix, right? I mean, and that's why we all go to it. I used to say, I used to be a blue water girl. And if you've ever used synthetic fertilizer, there's some that you can mix in water and then your water turns blue. You get gr instant gratification. But I'm telling you, the slow, the slow long haul, I'm right. the poster girl because now 25, 30 years in, I mean, we don't use, we can skip using fertilizers when it doesn't fit our schedule and still grow a great crop because our soil is so ha happy and healthy. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about seedlings first. When do you start fertilizing your seedlings? And then what is that routine like? What do you use and how frequently do you fertilize? Sure. So the bottom line is this. I fertilize um, all of our plants that are in trays on Mondays. And anybody that has been moved off of the seedling heat mat over to, if they're under a grow light or they're out on the carport, they get their weekly fertilization. The only ones that I do not fertilize are those that are on the seedling heat mat that haven't completed the sprouting stage yet. Um, so basically everybody gets it except for what's on the heat mat or maybe something that's just not completely sprouted. And I do use the Neptune's Harvest, which is fish and seaweed fertilizer. Um, and one of the things that you may notice that's really different about organic fertilizers is the numbers um, are much lower. And it's really hard to burn plants with organic fertilizers, meaning that the nitrogen's not so high that you can actually harm your plants. Um, but I just follow the directions that are actually on the label for house plants um, and just pour in the appropriate amount into my watering can. And I just do my normal watering. It's just on Mondays, everybody gets a little bit of food if they're under a grow light or out on the carport hardening off. Right. And the Neptune's Harvest, it's a liquid fertilizer. It's based on fish and seaweed. And the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium right. numbers are 231, just in case you're looking for something comparable. Exactly. And there is a warning, though. Um, or seaweed fish fertilizers is a little aromatic. Oh, um, yes. I, I do not. <laughs> um, I would love to spray mist my blocks and my plants with it in this stage indoors. But I mean, your family will literally pack your bag and kick you to the curb because it is pretty raunchy, stinky. Um, but I find mixing it gently in my watering can, you just have to be careful, don't spill it. I try not to get it on my hands um, and be very diligent about that. And it does great. Yeah. So you're saying you would mist the seeds themselves before they've even sprouted as the well as the seedlings if it weren't uh, so aromatic? Yes. One of the things I learned many years ago from an organic lawn care professional, um, the first one in the state of Virginia, actually, um, and they said that they um, mist lawns that they seed. Um, so they sow seed for grass and then they mist it with a seaweed fish or even a compost tea type mixture and it really aids germination. And yes, I have found that to be true, but it is very difficult to bear the smell and I would not do that with a synthetic, which it normally does not have a good, it doesn't have an odor. You can smell it, but it's not as stinky. Okay, so just to summarize, if you're using the Neptune's Harvest organic liquid fertilizer we described, a good routine is to fertilize once a week at the house plant rate listed on the back of the bottle. So for example, if you're soil blocking, you would just use that water with the fertilizer mixed in to actually water your blocks on that day of the week. In our house, we call it Fertilizer Friday, just to make it fun and easy to remember. And you can wait to start doing that until your seedlings have actually germinated, unless you're wanting to mist your seeds like Lisa described. Yes. And something else we should have mentioned too is that if you have seedlings growing in your grow room, for example, or hardening off outside, and maybe you realize you're going to be delayed and not going to be able to plant those out when you thought you were going to be able to, you might want to manipulate your fertilizer routine to try to slow that growth down, right? Yeah. We do a lot of manipulating. I was just looking at that today. We'll cut back on water, um, temperature adjustment, and for sure, the first thing we give up if we're trying to slow people down is to stop feeding them. Um, yeah. Again, because we follow an organic living soil process, 
um, they can really take care of themselves. Um, it's that acceleration that we demand out of our plants as growers um, that we just want to put the brakes on. And um, so, yeah, so let's just say that happens. I would immediately skip my weekly fertilization. And when I say even water, um, I like, and especially if it's cloudy, and that's typically what happens to us, it'll all of a sudden be cloudy, rainy for days and days. And it's just not a great time to be planting out, getting out in the garden to plant. Um, we can also actually sometimes even skip watering because the because they're outside on the carport, right? They're not getting watered, but it's cooler it's cloudy, it's not hot. Yeah. And so we just, I just kind of monitor it. Yeah. So you can definitely manipulate how fast stuff grows. All right. So now we're going to talk about bed preparation. So when you're outdoors preparing your beds, do you put down fertilizer? And if so, what do you use? And you can also talk about compost as well, if you'd like. Sure. So whenever we do a bed flip, which is at the end of a crop, um, so let's just assume we're not going to cover crop, which sometimes we do that now, but Typically for the first like decade and a half of when I didn't have much space here on the farm, um, I didn't cover crop at all. We, we used compost, leaf mold, um, and organic fertilizers to feed our soil. And so when a crop would end, we would literally pull that crop out uh, because it didn't have a tractor back then, right? So, I mean, we would pull a crop out to get the vegetation out of the bed. Um, we would then put down about two to three inches of finished compost or leaf mold, and then we would use um, organic dry fertilizer. Um, and the one that we've, there's been a, a change in brands through the years, um, but we actually have used the chicken litter based organic dry fertilizer. And you can, you can see it, Lane's got it up on the screen now, but you can find it over on our store if you want to read more about it and what's in it. Um, it's dry pelleted processed chicken litter, and it does a great job. So we apply that. It's about three pounds per hundred square feet, and that's about seven and a half cups. Um, and we apply at that rate, and then we incorporate all that into the surface of the bed. Um, and you just can't imagine how your plants hit the ground running. Yes. And the NPK numbers for that fertilizer, again, it's a granular fertilizer, chicken litter based. The NPK is five, four, and three in case you're looking for something similar. And is that the only time you actually use this granular fertilizer is when you're preparing the beds? So funny, you should ask that. Now, in a perfect world, I would love to do a second application a little bit later, but because I have a golden retriever that loves to eat it. Um, so when we do that oh. initial, when we do that initial application, we turn, that's why we incorporate it into the soil. He pretty much leaves that alone. But later in the growing season, the only option is really to like just um, lay it down on the bed and then it will just break down and go into the bed. We can't do that here with us because our dog will just eat it right up. Um, so we fertilize in a different way um, with liquid, but this would be a great one to follow up. We do like some vegetables. We grow sweet corn here. We do do that second application um, a little later in the season, but then we actually till those pathways and it throws soil up on top of that fertilizer. So it kind of buries it. So good old Tucker doesn't have a snack. <laughs> okay. So to summarize again, you would incorporate two to three inches of finished compost or leaf mold, as well as a dry organic fertilizer, like the one we described into your beds when you prepare them. And you can do a second application of the fertilizer later in the season, unless you have golden retriever issues like Lisa. Exactly. It's good stuff. It is. Okay. So now let's talk about once you have actual seedlings transplanted out into the garden or you direct seeded and they're out there in the garden, how do you fertilize your growing seedlings and even the full grown plants? And is there a difference in the way you fertilize those two? Sure. So we do far less fertilization than people imagine that we do, but it is because we have fed our soil with organic fertilizers as well as organic matter, you know, compost yes. and leaf mold for all these years. So our soil is really kind of fat and happy, right? Um, so once plants are planted out in the garden, remember they're being planted into that bed that was prepared with compost and organic um, granular fertilizer. Um, and we really don't do anything 
until perhaps later in the season, depending on how, what the workload is, we will sometimes do what's called a soil drench. Um, and you can do that either by mixing up the seaweed fish in a big container and just pouring it on the soil in the bed, or you can run it through irrigation if you happen to have a fertigator. Um, which we do that also. Um, you can also spray it onto the foliage like a foliar feed. Um, so all of those things, frankly, I would love to do it like every two or three weeks, but our workload is just such here that you can't do it. And once the plants start setting buds, we totally stop any foliar feeding because you don't want your flowers to smell like seaweed and fish. Yes. So you prepare your garden beds and then you don't really have a routine right. per se when it comes to fertilizing the actual seedlings and plants that are growing out there. Correct. Okay. Are there any plants that you actually don't fertilize or that you fertilize more or less frequently? Are there any beds that you purposely don't add fertilizer to certain flowers that prefer a leaner soil or does everything get the same treatment? In general, yes, everything gets the same treatment. And there are some, because it's got a low nitrogen load, all of our fertilizers that we use do, um, even those that typically are known to like leaner soil do okay with it. Um, for instance, I think of yarrow and feverfew, yes. you know, some of those that just don't really need that additional fertilization. Um, and also we try to go really easy and I, it's easier for me to do this um, on zinnia beds. Zinnias um, like fairly decent soil, which we have even without fertilizer, right? But fertilizer also can fuel if mildew is present in a crop, it actually feeds and fuels that mildew. And I learned that many years ago at a university from an ag agent, um, just happened to mention that and mention that in passing. And I thought, holy cow, no wonder I had mildew just take off. So um, because I was just treating it like everything else and just giving it a, its regular dose. So we don't, we try to avoid fertilizing the beds. Um, that the zinnias go in, but our beds are all fairly fertile. So when we add fertilizer, it's kind of taking it up a notch. So that's pretty much the only ones we make a conscious effort, I would say, to avoid. Okay. So what is foliar feeding and do you ever do this method of fertilizing? You touched on it just a little while ago, yeah. but what is this for people that are wondering? Sure. Foliar feeding means to actually apply whatever the fertilization or compost tea, whichever you want to call it, um, you apply it to the leaves, the vegetation, the, the above ground part of the plant. And I believe that, you know, foliar feeding, and especially applying compost tea, creates bionic plants. I mean, it's just really amazing how disease resistant they are and how it just kind of, in my mind, um, I kind of think of all those microorganisms that are down below soil level as little, little teeny soldiers marching around doing their job, you know. And when we apply organic products, whether compost tea or organic fertilizers, onto the, the surface of the plants, we're taking those same little guys and putting them up there. So we're getting just a whole nother benefit. Now, again, I will say that I wouldn't do that to zinnias uh, because again, you're exactly. kind of, you know, putting, putting that food right where the mildew is maybe lurking in the shadows, just waiting for what it needs to break out. Um, but yeah, that really works. And I will be really honest around here after the initial warm season planting, which we're just getting ready to start right now, which is about 12,000 plants. Um, we can, we get a foliar feeding in once, but then the garden takes off and we just never look back. We're just never able to really do it, but it is absolutely fabulous plants when you foliar feed. So if you had the time to do it, how often would you want to do a compost tea foliar feeding or something similar to that? So the two big differences um, for compost tea you have to make, um, yeah. I mean, organic liquid fertilizer, you just have to mix up and apply. Big difference between the two, compost tea has no odor. It should not have any odor whatsoever. So you can apply compost tea right up to right before you're going to, I mean, I wouldn't be composting a bud that's close to opening, but there's no odor, residual odor there. Um, right. Organic fertilizer, not the case, you know, so, um, so the organic fertilizers, you stop much earlier in the process, um, but it really depends. I mean, it's like if you have 
fairly okay soil and you're using dry organic fertilizers, you also don't want to go overboard because what right. happens when you encourage all that new flesh, fresh kind of grow um, foliage is then you start having perhaps aphid pressure. They're attracted to that new tender growth, right? Oh, a lot of it instead of just the natural process. I mean, I am trying to enhance nature, not take over for her. Um, so, you know, I would follow directions, but compost tea, if you could do that once a month, that would be a dream world. Yeah. And sometimes over fertilizing or fertilizing with the wrong mix of ingredients can result in less flowers and more yep. leafy foliage growth. Cosmos are an excellent example of that. Do we do not, I'm glad you said that, that just made it pop into my mind. <laughs> Cosmos, we do not fertilize at all at yeah. any stage because they, you'll just get all vegetation. Yep, exactly. So if yep. you are having a problem with that and you're trying to troubleshoot what the issue could be, definitely something to think about is how you've been fertilizing and whether or not you're dealing with a plant that actually performs better in less fertile soil. For sure. Okay. Last question. Do you fertilize your perennial and woody plants? So your peonies, your hydrangeas, your hellebores, if so, how do you do this? And when do you do this? Sure. So in general, no is the answer to that question, because we have a really big hellebore patch here under yep. a big tree. Um, and what we typically do for all three of those, the hellebores, peonies and hydrangeas, of which we have a lot of all of those, is we use compost. We use compost as mulch. Um, and again, we would not use the dry pellets because old Tucker would just be <laughs> literally, I mean, every golden retriever I've ever owned. I mean, I can still remember the first time I was side dressing a sweet corn and Steve called me, he was in the house and he could see the dog walking right behind me, eating right what I, and I wasn't looking behind me. So anyway, crazy dogs. <laughs> Um, so we pretty much rely on compost and just adding that organic matter. Leaf mold is another really great one. Yes. Um, just keeping the soil covered and in stuff that breaks down and, um, it just does a great job of providing nutrition. Yeah. If you're going to do one thing, adding compost to your beds is probably your best bet, especially in a garden yep. setting. Yes, for sure. All right. Well, that was our episode for today. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I hope that answered a lot of your questions about fertilizer routines. Make sure to follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And remember to leave us a rating or review in the podcast app that you're listening to us on or a like or comment over on YouTube. We always appreciate it. And we love hearing what you all have to say. Thank you so much, Lane. And remember, friends, you can learn more about us and all the work we're doing at thegardenersworkshop.com. Till we meet again, friends. Ciao. Bye.